Hello, I'm Amara Jones, and welcome to Lives at Stake. Lives at Stake is a series of monthly discussions about critical issues facing trans and gender nonconforming communities across the United States. Lives at Stake is a co-production of my project Translash and The Green Space. Visit translash.org and thegreenspace.org to follow our work. Well, November is the month in which we hold elections. And yes, we made it. We're still here. We're still alive um, today. Uh, but November is also Trans Awareness Month. And this Trans Awareness Month, there are so many breakthrough and historic events that we have to celebrate as trans people, such as the election of Sarah McBride, the first ever state senator who is trans to be elected in the United States, and also Maury Turner, who is Black and Muslim, and the first known non-binary person to be elected to a state legislature. But Trans Awareness Month culminates tomorrow in Trans Day of Remembrance, and that's the day that we commemorate all those loss to trans violence. And tragically, this year, 2020, is the year in which more trans people have been murdered than any other year on record. Here to help us unpack these two extremes, these two head-spinning extremes, is Samantha Allen, who is a journalist and author of Real Queer America, LGBTQ stories from red states, um, and also Melania Brown, who is the sister of Laylene Polanco, an Afro-Latinx woman who died in police custody at Rikers Island last year. And we're gonna end today's program with a really powerful performance from Mojo Disco, a black trans woman artist that was performed first at a Trans Day, trans Day of Remembrance event last year that we did at Samsung 837. That performance encapsulates so much of the emotion and the power of Trans Day of Remembrance that we wanted to share it with you again. There was no reason for us to try to top it, and it'll be how we conclude. Now, we always like to begin this show with gifts and memes that are getting us through, that are light and funny, because so many of the things that we talk about on this show are heavy. Um, you know, we didn't know that starting the year, uh, but all the ones that we're starting with today are going to focus on those that focus on trans day remembrance or on trans people. Um, so this first one I thought was really funny or interesting. One, because it's so perfect for the age of COVID, a scratchy voice leading you to panic, but then you realize that it's for those who medically transition. It may just be changes associated with uh, whatever treatment you're on to fulfill yourself and to become yourself. So you might have a scratchy voice. It has nothing to do with COVID. Um, we should all finish the year being that lucky. And this next one um, is really powerful for me because it's reflective of the thousands and thousands and thousands of images that you can go online to see today, hashtag Trans Awareness Week or Trans Day Remembrance of trans people documenting their own stories, documenting their own journeys uh, in every way imaginable, in every place imaginable across the country. And those stories are so inspirational to me. And this is just one of thousands. But of course, ultimately, this uh, particular meme by House of Resilience is what this day is all about. It's just all about the power to be ourselves and to be our full selves and to be our human selves. Too bad we have to have a week to commemorate that and a month to make that point. And of course, the day that underscores that so many people don't see us as human, which is how we have so many people who are not with us um, at this moment. But with that, one other thing, as always, as I tell you in the show, this is an interactive show. So that means that you have to interact. Uh, so of course, however you are watching us on YouTube or on Facebook, Make sure that you join the conversation and send us your questions using the hashtags lives at stake um, or translash. So hashtag lives at stake, hashtag translash. We will be sure to include your comments and questions within that. And of course, you can also follow along with the conversation or amplify the conversation on Twitter and Instagram using those same hashtags and we'll be sure as well to include your comments and your questions. Now on to the heart of our show. 
So this Trans Awareness Month marks a historic set of breakthroughs, especially electorally for trans people. And here to help us unpack how this happened despite a year in which so many trans people were murdered and a year in which so many trans people, specifically in red states, are facing a slew of anti-trans legislation is Samantha Allen, who is the author of Real Queer America, LGBT Stories from Red States. Samantha is not only an author of books, but also a journalist and has a PhD from Emory University. Samantha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Of course, of course. So besides everyone needing to buy your book, and it's a, we're entering holiday time, so it's a great holiday idea, um, I'm wondering if you can just help set the stage for what happened on election day with the number of trans people that had all of these electoral wins in places that are not only where you would expect, um, such as blue states, but also in Oklahoma and elsewhere. Yeah, so, you know, while everyone was anxiously watching for that big presidential result, I was busy documenting all of the transgender wins on election night. And what happened was transgender representation in state legislatures nearly doubled uh, on election night. So we saw, you know, uh, if you think back just three years ago, Danica Rome in Virginia was the only out transgender state legislature, uh, state legislator in the United States. And now, as of 2020, we've got Danica Rome in Virginia, Brianna Titone in Colorado, Jerry Cannon and Lisa Bunker in New Hampshire both won re-election. And then, as you mentioned earlier in the show, Sarah McBride is now the highest uh, ranking transgender public official in the country. Taylor Small won in Vermont. Stephanie Byers won in um, Kansas, Maureen, Marie Turner, who you mentioned earlier in Oklahoma, we're just seeing these transgender victories in state legislatures nationwide, not just in the expected places, you know, the blue states, but in places like Kansas and Oklahoma, too. What do you think is behind these victories? Um, I mean, as you say, it's a dramatic explosion in representation in all these places that you expect and not expect. What, what's driving these, these victories? You know, so I've interviewed probably about 65% of these candidates over the course of my journalistic career. And what almost all of them tell me is that when they saw Danica Rome win in Virginia, they realized they could do this too. And I think this is a dynamic that's going to be familiar to any trans person, whether you have aspirations to run for office or not. If you just see another trans person doing something that you didn't know was possible for you, it unlocks potential for you. And so that's how you get this like almost domino effect of Danica Rome winning. And then three years later, the number of transgender state legislators almost doubling. Um, it, it's, it's almost that simple to just see someone else chart out a path for you. Right. And it's why representation matters. And we forget that representation can be can have an exponential impact on, on a situation or, or a group of people. Um, I'm wondering if you could just dive a little bit deeper given the fact that you've spent so much time documenting the stories of queer people, trans people across the United States, particularly in red states. If you can just dive in and explain some of these wins like Maury Turner in Oklahoma. I mean, who would ever think that? Or as you say, wins in Kansas or even Brianna Titone, she had a really tough race, I think in an area that um, it leans Republican. And so what do you think is helping trans people win in these places that are not necessarily trans friendly? Yeah, so, you know, I think often trans folks in these places have witnessed attacks on trans people in their state legislatures. They've they've been sitting at home, like not in the halls of government, watching legislators try to file bills that attack our restroom rights or, or our rights to change our identity documents to uh, be more in accordance with our identity. And at some point, I think people are just saying enough, like, I guess the only way to stop that is to, to go stop it myself. And I think I just think that's so inspiring to see, you know, when I talk to uh, 
NGOs, um, you know, PACs that work on getting LGBTQ people elected, they all have this saying, they say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? If you're not there to make the decisions, your rights are going to be up for grabs. And I think increasingly we're seeing trans people in these places that have been thought of as being more traditionally hostile to LGBTQ folks say, no, I'm going to be at the table to take us off the menu. And then in that, what do you think, how do you think they're able to get people in these places to respond to them? So we've spoken really powerfully about how individual trans people just say, you know what, I'm going to go out and do this. I'm sick of taking it. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a part of the process and I'm going to win. What do you think is happening for people, for the electorate, um, uh, even in places where Danica is? I think that her district is also purplish. I don't think that it's overwhelmingly blue to be responsive to trans people. Um, uh, in in these places? What's happening with the electorate? Yeah, people are meeting trans people. Uh, you know, if you look at like public opinion polling, like several years ago, almost no one in the country knew an openly transgender person. Of course, they probably met transgender people who they didn't know were transgender. But years later, that percentage keeps going up. People are meeting transgender people. They're realizing that they're, they're their friends, their family members, their coworkers. And you can see like, again, with public polling data that even in these more conservative parts of the U.S., the overwhelming majority of folks do support LGBTQ protections, non-discrimination protections. So I think people's hearts and minds all across the country have been shifting in the right direction as they meet more queer folks, LGBT folks, trans folks. It's just a matter of getting that political power now. And that there's been a bit of a gap there that we're starting to close. And given the fact that you've looked at all of these um, races, <clears throat> excuse me, from the beginning since Danica Rome to where we've ended up now, as you say, you've spoken to, you know, uh, the, the majority of people that have run for office and who've won, who are trans. I'm wondering if you can just tell us what you think are this, is the significance um, of these wins in a in a broader lens of history, what do you what do you think? What where are we in this moment? Do you think? And what do you think is the, as I say, the significance much more broadly of of these wins for where the country might be going with respect to to us? Yeah, I think it's a moment of coming out of the shadows. You know, I recently talked to a lot of folks in New Hampshire about the significance of having not just one, but two transgender state legislators in the state house. And, you know, just everyday trans folks in New Hampshire were telling me like, that they found that inspiring. Maybe they want to run for office or maybe they feel more comfortable or safer being out in their small town. I think it has this, this huge cultural impact that can be hard to trace because you, you can't really quantify it, but you talk to trans folks on the ground and you get this overwhelming feeling of hope when you see wins like this. You know, I think in our LGBT movement for too long, you know, I, I think sometimes leaders of our, our LGBT movement more broadly, we're kind of scared of letting trans people own our stories or meet the public or interact with the public. There was concern of like, oh, people are going to be afraid of trans people or not know how to categorize us or not know what to do with us. And I think what we're seeing with these huge groundbreaking wins, these very public facing victories, that when people get to know trans people, they like us <laughs> you know it's 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 hard to stop that it's hard to unring that bell yeah um and let's hope that that bell keeps being rung lar larger and uh, louder and harder um I, it's so funny because i think about things like you know lala zanel who works at aclu for the longest time she's had this whole campaign, personal campaign, Lala for president. And as she talked about it, she does it because she wants people to think that there can be a trans president, right? Like that we should be dreaming big um, in these places and these moments in terms of, as you say, like shifting the way that people think of us. Um, lastly, one of the things I wanna ask you about, given that we're in New York, um, you know, New York City 
you know, liberal, lots of trans people, very strong protections for trans people across the board and services, ironically has never elected anyone trans to any political office. That could change next year because there are two candidates um, running for um, city council um, next year, but that's never happened. But it has happened in, in certain red states, right? And so I'm wondering if you can just tell us what you think that means. Why, is it a, why are places that are more hostile electing us and then places that are seemingly open to us, you know, ha that hasn't happened? Yeah, you know, when I wrote my book, someone told me a quote that kind of became the this thesis statement, which was oppression and opposition can build really powerful connections. So I, I feel like there there is something about that atmosphere of a red state where this kind of like onslaught of legislative attacks can kind of band the LGBTQ community together, make people realize the importance of getting trans people in public office. And that's why I think you sometimes see red states, you know, showing up blue state counterparts in terms of setting some of these precedents. I think it has everything to do with with people like reacting to some of these these attacks. Um, I, I don't think that means we're never going to see a trans state legislator in New York. I think that that will come soon and I hope it does. Well, let's hope it does too, but here's to celebrating the powerful wins and changes um, this month, even at the, even as there's so much difficulty um, in this moment. And thank you so much, um, Samantha, for your work, for your work as a journalist, for telling our stories, for following these races, for believing that these important these are important, and to documenting the full range of who we are, not just in blue states, but also in red states. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Of course. That was Samantha Allen, who is a journalist, author of uh, my mind is on blank. <laughs> Um, oh, I, I have it again. Uh, author of Real Queer Stories, LGBT. Why am I, what's happening to me right now? I, I'm, I'm having a moment. It's been a long week. Real Queer America, LGBT mm -hmm. stories from red states. Um, and also is a PhD from Emory University. You are watching Lives at Stake and I am Amara Jones. It's clearly time for me to take a break. <laughs> and that's happening next week. Um, also remember to follow along uh, using hashtags lives at sake uh, and also um, translash so that we can include your questions and comments as we move on. So from kind of the hope and the power um, of trans people being displayed this uh, month so far, we're moving on to what is one of the hardest and the most difficult parts of Trans Awareness Month and that is Trans Day of Remembrance tomorrow. Um, one of the things that has happened, as I mentioned before at the top of our program, is that 2020 is the year in which more trans people have been murdered than any other year on record. There's so many reasons for that. But one of the things that is clear about the facts um, that so many people are not longer here is that they leave behind friends and loved ones. And so often in the way that the deaths of trans people of color, are, of color are covered, we never are able to hear the voices of those um, loved ones, meaning that we don't really fully see them as humans, which of course contributes to how those people are no longer with us in the first place. And that's why I wanted to speak tonight with Melania Brown, who is the sister of Leilene Polanco, an Afro-Latinx woman who uh, died in custody at Rikers Island last year, last June. I first interviewed Melania last year and wanted to sit down with her one year later to talk about um, her journey, the family, her family's journey, and what she's just learned about uh, trans people in America. Thank you, Melania, for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me and sharing your space with me once again. Of I course. Appreciate it. Sharing space with you is easy. Um, first, I'm wondering <laughs> if you can just remind, first, if you can just remind us of Laylene's case. What happened to her last June? 
So um, Leilene, um, she was Leilene Polanco. I'm Leilene Polanco, older sister, Melania Brown. My sister um, was, um, she caught a seizure while being held in solitary confinement at Rikers Island. Um, Rikers knew about her medical condition. They, she even caught several seizures before um, they decided to place her back into solitary confinement. Um, and, you know, against all medical uh, objectives of keeping her out, Rikers still decided to place her in solitary confinement simply because of her gender identity. It was nothing else. It was now that I could speak more on the case, there was evidence brought up that they emails were going back and forth that they didn't know how to house my sister. So <laughs> that that cat is out of the hat. Um, so my sister basically died for just being who she was, being true to herself. It, it, it cost her life. Um, my sister died last year on June 7th, 2019. One of the most excruciating things about her death and why it's so illustrative of why we have so many trans people who aren't with us right now is just how callous the guards were at Rikers about her. They were callous about her medical condition, callous about her seizing, and callous about her in death. Um, you know, um, not being properly respectful of her and her life. Um, you mentioned how that seeing that and knowing that on top of her death put a huge hole for your family. And I'm just wondering if you can just talk about um, how that's impacted your family still one year later and how everyone's doing. How are you doing? How are Laylene's nieces doing? How's your mom doing? Um, we're taking, we, I mean, crying is our new norm roller coaster emotions not knowing how you're gonna wake up the next day is our new norm um my daughters you know they dealing with emotions they miss they aunt they were very that those were her best friends like they weren't even like had that aunt and um niece relationship they were best friends um they miss her very much my mom you know she's uh, she's broken crying for her is is, is normal now um, seeing how the video was released and um, watching those correctional officers laughing while she was taking her last breath was very disturbing. And it was out there for the world to see, to see our pain and to share what we were going through. And yet nothing happened. The, the, the state hasn't done anything. The government hasn't done anything. The only thing that we received were, were broken promises from the mayor. I'm going to call them broken promises because those were promises that he made as far as ending solitary confinement. And we're in, in October and he used my sister's name in vain to, mm -hmm. to push it out there and, and, and grab the people's attention because at the time, everybody, my sister was, she still is a big movement, you know, which I also would like for her not to be just a movement because she is a human but he used her name he used her platform to get grab people's attention and he has yet to do anything about that um so my family and i we're, we're not okay i don't think we're ever going to be okay Leilene was Leilene was like the rock they usually you know you always have a rock in the family that keeps the family pieced together and she was that rock for us and we don't have her no more. So it's a big, big hit for, for, you know, all of us. We're still grieving. We, we miss her. We're always going to miss her. Um, yeah. So I, I take it day by day and I'm trying not to cry, but, um, it's hard. It's really hard. It's really hard because I don't care. Like what they needed to understand is however they viewed her, that, that was, first of all, that was, an opinion their their own personal reasoning of how they viewed her but she belonged to someone you know she was our human she was our person like it's not okay for you to rip people out of other people's life because you're not okay with the way that they're living their own life it just makes no sense to me to this day so we're still to, going through it what do you have to say to people who say or act as if trans people aren't connected to people who love them, you know, are, are you know, somehow aren't human. I'm 
always struck by in so many of these cases when you read about perpetrators that the perpetrators don't think that they did anything wrong. They don't think that there's anybody right. who, who loves the people that they have taken. And I'm wondering, what do you have to say to that? Like what, if you had, if you had to say something to those people, what would that be? Cause it's common. Yeah. I mean, I would say that it's, it's very, just the way of their thinking is very inhumane. It's not humankind. Um, the, you know, these are humans we're talking about, like, like scratch everything that you're, the, everything else that we're talking about human being life, you know, and they be, like I said, we, these are our loved ones. Like, you know, you have loved ones out there. Like, it's not okay because you feel some type of way. And, and I'm going to be honest. I feel like a lot of people that attacked the LGBTQ youth is because they're not comfortable in their own sexuality. They're not comfortable to come out. So they hate on those that do have that strength because it takes a lot to be truly yourself. It takes a lot of strength to be exactly who you are meant to be. And I feel like these human these other people out there hurting the uh, you know the community and stuff like that i feel like you need to stop like you you the, the they're humans like you you're hurt like look at me like I, they took my sister away from me and she was she was someone big in my life like you know she was my little sister but i looked up to my little sister she was my little sister that was my big sister like stop it like this no if you don't you don't have to like it you don't have to be around it but you will have to learn to respect it respect other people's space back up it's not your life like let people live and let people be who they're meant to be. Like, I, I just feel like, you know, if any, any of these people are listening, which I'm sure a lot of them tune in to things like this, like just back off, go drink your water and mind your business. Whatever other people do in their life is not affecting you. Who, whatever they decide to do with their own the, the temple, because these are these are our, our body that God, Allah gave to us. I'm Muslim. Allah gave me this body, and this is my temple. Who are you to tell me or, or anyone how to live their life? Like th there has to be something very mental, something really going on in there, something really bad that you need help, that you need to go out your way to hurt someone that's not doing anything to to hurt your life. Like, just stop. Like, enough is enough. And 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 I had enough. And I, I'm sure a lot of people had enough, you know. And and this goes to a, a lot out there, which I want to also put out there. Because there's a lot of, you know, that I've noticed this whole time of doing this activism work, you know, a year and a half um, after my sister passing, that I've noticed that there's a lot of hypocrites. A, a lot of them out there. Because they'll go out there and they'll scream, Black Lives Matters, right? Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. But what about Black trans trans lives? Like, what about them? They're freaking Black too. They're Black. So you want us to go out there and scream to, to help you, but you're doing exactly what you don't want people to do to you. You can't scream help Black Lives Matter, and yet you're hurting another life. Another life. Like, it makes no sense whatsoever to me. It makes no sense. Like, you, you guys need to back off. You guys need to, like, accept life for what it is. And we are all, we all live with our truth. And we are all going to, you know, live by it, die by it. If it's not affecting you, mind your business. You don't have to be around any anything that you don't like. You don't have to be around any conversations that you don't, don't want to be around. But guess what? You do have to respect people's space and and that's what i have to say like i i, I could say a lot more but I'm um, back to you. enough is enough i think is all we should ever have to say um one last question is about your activism um you have there's so many ways that we can respond to grief and to pain but one of the ways that you have responded to tragedy in your family is by standing up uh, for trans people, for demanding changes in um, the criminal justice system to an end to mass incarceration, to an end to solitary confinement. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about your, your activism and why you chose that. Because honestly, not everyone 
who loses someone even as tragically as you did this, does that. And you've, that's what you've done with your life since last June. Um, well, I honestly, I was never like a type of person like to speak in front of big crowds or even be around them. Like, you know, I get very nervous and I, and I shut down, but, um, my first, the first time, my first rally that I had, um, it was with uh, the anti-violence, pro the anti-violence project. Um, they got in contact with the family and three days, um, later I had a mic in my hand and it was very, um, you know, I was very nervous. I was very scared. I had LEL, um, you know, by my side the whole time, which he has been helping me develop, you know, and so I still have a lot of more work to do because this is all new to me, but he has helped me develop into, you know, this um, activist and he's still teaching me how to express myself. Um, to me, it helps me. It helps me grieve. It helps me, mm. you know, just going out there and, and just and just when I go out there and I, I'm getting goosebumps when I go out there and I speak and I see so many humans, this community come together and so much love and so much hugs and so much like just it's just like it's so it just feels so right, like, you know, and just to have all that love that helps me to know that I'm out there spreading my sister's story, which can help many other, you know, women. Um, it helps me like just knowing that, you know, her, she won't, her death didn't go in vain and good things could, you know, it was horrible what they did to her, but if good things could come out of it and her death didn't go in vain, then that helps me. It just, to me, it's a grieving thing. Like, you know, um, when I come together and I see such a big community that comes and, and they stand up for what's right and they come out to hear my sister's story and it just it, it get it, it feels like um I was just telling my therapist this last week it feels like a like a like a like a like a safety blanket like like I'm like it, like I'm home like they they got me like I'm I could fall here and I'm okay like they're hearing me like you know um it's you and, and a lot of uh people that come out you know they're going through these things that, that themselves they're going through you know certain uh the same things that my sister went through like you know they they still going through it or they've been through it and you know just if I could if I could be that to me, because a lot of the conversations that come out, you know, throughout the whole year, I have, I, I got called a cis, a cisgender. I, I, I didn't even know what that was until, <laughs> you know, so I didn't even know. I'm like, okay. I didn't even know what it was, but I've been called things like, you know, but to me, it's okay. If you want to call me, I don't really, like, I, I, I don't really sit you know, talk about my, my gender identity or what I do with my personal life, because I, I, I am me, like, you know what I'm saying? And everybody's different, but if I could be that, 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 that little line of like hope between this world that we're trying to get to understand that we are all humans and we're all in the same human race. If I could be that, that, you know, that little line, like that little, that could bring everything together to me, that's, that's more than enough to me. That's healing to me. That's helping me. Not only am I helping heal, but I, it's helping me. Like I can't, I don't even know how to describe it. Honestly, it's like a whole bunch, bunch of emotions, but I do know that I love what I do and I love going out there. I love screaming to the top of my lungs, <laughs> marching down the city. Like it, it just helps me release so much anger because I first, honestly, my mind was everywhere. Like, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to like go after whoever did whatever to my sister, like, you know, normal human thoughts when you lose someone that was very close to you. Mm -hmm. And then I started learning that, why would I do that? No, I'm going to let you do what you do. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to observe and I'm going to come with a, a, a stronger strategy. I'm going to knock your whole, your whole, your whole show down, your whole plan down. I'm not going to hurt you. I could hurt you in a way that's that's legal and you can't do anything about it like you know like just my activism work i'm very grateful i'm very grateful for the anti-violence project I'm, I'm extremely grateful for lel because it has helped me so much honestly if i didn't have this i probably would have been like in a mental institute right now like i have my moments i had multiple mental breakdowns i don't even know how i'm 
I could still, you know, speak or, and talk and function as a human after so many mental breakdowns. But I'm extremely grateful for my work. And, and I'm here. This is just, this is me. This is my path. This is a purpose that my sister gave me. And like I always say, they took my sister, they killed my sister because my sister didn't die. They killed my sister. But my sister knew I needed love. And my sister made sure that she sent the whole community my way. And I, and I'm loved. And if I'm loved, I, you guys are loved by me. And, you know, and I'm going to continue to fight. I'm going to continue to do what's right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we, I know I speak for everyone where we are thankful for you and your work and grieve alongside of you, the loss of your sister and are sending you and your family all the best for what is going to be another hard holiday season. Um, but I'm so grateful that you came on tonight and, um, for any time that I get a chance to talk with you. Thank you so much, Melania. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. <laughs> Bye, good night. That was Melania good Brown, night. who is uh, the sister of Laylene Polanco, an Afro-Latinx woman who died in custody at Rikers Island, the nation's largest jail last year. Um, we're going to end tonight's program with uh, a really powerful performance. One of the ways in which trans people often respond to the violence in society is through creativity and arts. Last year, TransLash uh, created a program, a Trans Day Remembrance program, at which Mojo Disco, a trans artist, wrote and performed a piece about what it is like to be a Black trans woman in an extremely hostile society. We're gonna end our program with that performance tonight. As I mentioned, uh, there was no reason for us to try to do anything new or to create a new artistic piece because that, Peace by Mojo stands the test of time. We want to thank you for joining us on this Trans Day of Remembrance program that we put together, which spotlights so many of the victories that we had this month and things to celebrate. And of course, tonight um, we end instead at the opposite end with warning. Thank you for joining us at Lives at Stake, and we will see you next month in December. Check our website for the date of the next Lives at State program. Couldn't see this coming down my eyes, so I had to make the sax cry. I couldn't see this coming down my eyes, so I had to make the sax cry. I'm tired. I'm tired of waking each day not knowing if it's my last. Shaving my face to make sure I pass. I'm tired of training my waist to get me a shape. I'm tired of tucking my love with the stickiest of tape. I'm tired to do of all these things to make sure I'm alive. I couldn't see it come down my eyes, so I had to make the stags cry. See, I'm a fat black trans woman. I'm not supposed to exist with all of this body, these breasts, these hips. How dare she come outside and choose to just live 
speak truth to power with gloss on her lips. Being trans is a myth in a world full of cis. And no, I don't mean cis like eco gel and acrylic tips. I mean cisgender. It don't matter where you land either, because the straights give me their hate, but the gays give me their fever. Yeah, we're the alphabet gangsters. But I've noticed that L, G, and B often align with the oppressor to victimize the T. Now, I don't say it to be mean. Now, I don't mean to be cruel. But when black trans women are being killed twice a month, what do you do? Do you normalize our spirits? Or do you hush your lips in shame? Do you misgender us in death so the families can't be blamed? Do you tell our stories in humanizing form? Or do you touch yourself in private mode while watching T.S. porn? See, unlike your tabs, trans folk can't be closed. And no matter the resistance, our stories will be told. I had Marsha on my pen when I wrote this piece. I had Sylvia in my mind when I graced the page. Octavia on my lips when it's time to speak. My mama and my movement when I burns my sage. Black trans women are here to stay. We have always been here since the beginning of time. You cannot kill the spirit when the soul is divine. You cannot make ugly a face so damn fine. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I have diamonds between my thighs? See, a black poet named Maya Angelou taught me to still rise. So I will arise above this administration that is curating my demise. We need access to health care. We need access to safe spaces. We need employment opportunity. We need housing. We need people willing to stand up and educate the ignorance so the labor ain't always on us. We need the love of our families. We need lovers in the daytime, even if we don't pass. We need not to be outed whenever you're mad. We need our humanity not to be reduced to sexual intercourse whenever we share our truth. Cause at the end, of the day, trans people don't transition for you. We gonna take it to church, clap for me. Slow it down, y'all. Come on. All right. for life and all the loves inside of me I'll stand as tall as the tallest tree and I'm thankful for each day that I'm given those that are good and the hard ones I'm living but most of all I'm thankful for loving who I 